Today we're going to have a look at ozone elements from Isotope. And ozone elements is mainly targeted towards uh, mixing engineers and producers that want to master their own music. And to be honest, I haven't used this much at all, so it will be great fun for me as well to dive into this plugin and see what it can do. And to be totally clear, I'm not affiliated with Isotope and they are not sponsoring this video in any way. So I am totally free to have my own opinions on this. And they did a giveaway of this plugin a few months ago, so I got it for free and I guess many others did as well. And Ozone Elements is sort of an entry level uh, version of their flagship product, which is Ozone 10. And Elements is still on uh, version 9, so there are newer and probably improved features in uh, the, the full version, the Ozone 10 version. And I will be looking at it from the point of view of a professional mastering engineer. I have been working as a full-time mastering engineer for more than 20 years now, and I run a mastering company together with Sofia, and we also have this channel together. But let's have a look at what we can do in Elements. We have an equalizer, and we have an imager, and we have a maximizer. These are the three modules that we have available in Elements. And if you are mastering professionally, then you probably need more options than this. But if you are working with your own mixes, then this might actually be just what you need. Because you will have control over all the other aspects already in the mix. So for the final mastering, you might only need a bit of equalization, maybe a bit of stereo widening, and maybe a bit of uh, loudness in the final limiter. The first thing I like to do when I'm testing a new plugin is to see what does it do without any processing. What is the default sound of the plugin? Okay, so right away we can hear that it does something to the sound. I suspect, yeah. If we, if we look in the maximizer section, we can see that it's adding 2 dBs of gain by default. That's the oldest trick in the book in order to make a plugin sound like it's doing something useful already when enabling it. So let's remove that. This is a fairly standard equalizer. We have several bands and each band can be set to be a shelving or a bell or a low pass or a high pass and there are some additional options for each of these types as well. And as far as I can see there are no real surprises here. We have a uh, low shelving and the Q value seem to affect the slope of the shelf. Then we have the peak bands. This is a bell filter. Proportional Q, bell and band shelf. So proportional Q usually means that if you are boosting a lot then the band will get narrower as well. So the filter will get narrower when cutting much or boosting much. That's a very useful and intuitive type of filter, I think. The standard bell filter is a bit different and you can see that you are affecting a wider and wider area when uh, boosting or cutting a lot. So what usually happens for me is that I will tweak the Q value depending on how much boost or cut I'm doing. And in the proportional Q type, then this will be done automatically. So that's what, what I would use in these cases. For the high shelving, we have the same types of um, shelving filters as we had for the low end. And then we also had a high pass filter. So there is the flat type. And what is that? It seems to be a normal Butterworth type of filter. Let's see, low pass, flat. Yes, it's a Butterworth filter. This is a very common filter type to use for audio and for mastering because it sounds good. There are no surprises with these kinds of filters, and I would usually have it at 12 dB per octave if I want to remove some low end. We actually have a video specifically about low cut filters. You can have a look at that if you want to learn more about uh, low cut filters. But then there was something called brick wall. This seemed to be a very, very sharp filter. Let's have a look. What does it say? Elliptic filters. Okay, optimized for steepness with minimum ripple in the passband and stop band. Okay, elliptic filters are in my opinion, not very useful for audio because they tend to sound a bit unnatural, at least to my ears. But I guess that there are use cases for that. And it might be good to know that elliptic filters have two meanings when it comes to mastering. Either it can be this kind of filter. This is a filter design that is called elliptic. 
just as there are Butterworth filter types. But elliptic filter can also mean the kind of filter that you use when cutting vinyl in order to reduce the width of the low end. But that is not what this means. This refers to the filter type. Okay, so just by looking at this EQ and the features that it have, I can say that this seemed to be a very useful equalizer. And there's one interesting button here that says analog. Uh, we can choose between analog and digital. The analog type is a standard minimum phase IIR filter. And the digital is a linear phase FIR filter. So that's a nice option to have. And there also seem to be some uh, digital only features like the face and surgical filter shapes that is only available in the digital mode. So let's have a look at that. If we switch this to digital, then we should have some more controls here. Let's see. Okay, so we have a surgical version as well. And what does this do? Huh, that's strange. You can see the dip is not as deep as it um, was using analog. No, okay. Let's see if I move this around. Okay. Oh, oh, okay. Okay, so you can see this. The, the filter response is sort of waving like this. This is a clear sign that the, the filter resolution is not as good as it could be. And that's a byproduct of using uh, FIR filters. And this type of behavior is usually because the filter kernel is too short. That's way too technical to go into. But I would guess that we can find some settings for this um, equalizer. Okay, frequency resolution 12 hertz and filter size 14. 1095 samples so let's see if we set three hertz okay then we get a much bigger filter size and we also get the correct shape of the filter but this will also use much more cpu and uh, it will also cause more latency in the plugin but let's keep it at that for the moment because now we can see that the oh now it gets sluggish the fps is too too low now so uh, I will set this at 12 Hertz again my computer doesn't really handle that too well so where were we yes there uh, there were some other filter types and I think the surgical let's see what the manual says okay it doesn't say exactly what this kind of filter does but if we compare uh, the proportional Q type with the surgical bell, then it seems like this is a bit wider while still having very sharp edges. So I would guess that this is useful at times. But another feature that we had with the digital filter is that you can set the phase. So it can go from linear phase to minimum phase with this slider. And that can be really useful at times, especially when doing these kind of narrow dips in the upper mid-range, then linear phase can often sound more transparent than minimum phase. But that being said, I would probably use this filter in analog mode instead, because I think the low end resolution is very important to have as well if, if I need to do more narrow tweaks there. Yeah, okay, let's leave that. Okay, so then we have this button, stereo, mid side or left and right. And I would guess that this mode will let us um, equalize mid and side separately. So now we can select mid or side. So we have different filters for mid and side now. So I can do something in the mid channel and, and do something different in the side channel. So that's nice. If I want to link them together, then okay, they are still different. So if I'm doing like this then okay so that will follow okay so they are linked but they are not keeping the same setting so if I reset everything like that and then do mid side and then link then I will get okay now I have the same setting for mid and side so I can have one band that is acting on both mid and side and then I can unlink if I want to make a tweak for the mid channel only and then it will be only for the mid channel. Okay, so that's very useful. I would probably need to adjust to this workflow, but it's definitely a useful feature. And I would guess that left and right will do the same thing, but for the left and right channels instead. 
Yeah. Okay. So I would probably use this equalizer as a standard stereo equalizer and then set it to mid side if I wanted to tweak the mid and side separately. Uh, okay. But it seems as if I'm doing some tweaks in stereo mode and then switch to mid side, then those settings will only appear in the mid channel, but not in the side channel. So can I copy these settings? over to the side channel. Okay, so I can't seem to find a way to copy the settings from the mid channel to the side channel, so I would need to recreate these by hand. So I guess that the best workflow would be to uh, start in mid side, have the channels linked, do the things that you want to do, and then if you want to tweak something differently, then you can unlink the channels and then go and do those things. Okay, so that's a bit of a tricky workflow, I think. If you happen to know how to copy the settings from mid to side, then please write that in the comments. That could be really helpful. Okay, so no surprises there, I think. It sounds and behaves just as I would um, expect it to do. I see that there is an S button here. I think this is a solo, yes. Okay, so this is useful. Then I can find the right frequency area that I want to address. And uh, okay, so the Q value doesn't change this. Uh, okay. So the Q value doesn't affect the area that I'm listening to, but if I... Okay, so that's a bit of a workflow thing as well. My favorite equalizer is uh, Equilibrium from uh, DMG Audio. And when using that, then you can use this uh, band solo feature to also tweak the Q values. I find that very useful. But in this equalizer, then you will need to uh, disable and enable the solo button in order to update the area that you are listening to. So that's probably something that you can get used to. Okay, so Alt Solo, you can use the Alt Option key when clicking a node or anywhere in the spectrum to momentarily solo a specific frequency region. Okay, Alt Solo. Ooh. Okay, so that's useful. Okay, so Alt and click solos a frequency band and you can use the mouse wheel to set the width of this area. And this is exactly the kind of feature that I would use in uh, Equilibrium to find a resonance, for example. But now when I release this, I don't know what the Q value was. Okay, so it seems as if I'm alt clicking and using the mouse wheel to set the Q value, then it kind of updates, but it's very slow. Okay, I don't know what to make of this. So it seems as if I'm using the solo button, then the Q value will not update the soloed frequency area. But if I'm alt clicking the node and using the mouse wheel, then the, the area that I'm listening to will be updated. But if I'm alt clicking somewhere in the graph, then the, the Q value of this band will be updated in real time. So I would really like to have this behavior when soloing the band. Okay, so the last thing that I found in the EQ section is this button, and this will give you an overview of all the bands that are enabled, and you can have up to eight different bands in, um, in this equalizer. 
And that's usually plenty enough to solve any situation that might appear. One thing I haven't talked too much about is how to set the equalizer. That's very much dependent on the mix, of course, and how you want it to sound. In this case, I think the mix sounds quite okay, but it needs a bit of high end, high mid and high end. And it also is a bit heavy in the low end. This is an old recording that I did together with a friend uh, a long time ago. I think it was in 2008. I think this mix is, yeah, 14 years ago. So this is me and a friend. He writes the songs and he sings and he plays a bit of guitar and I produce and record and play most of the instruments. On this song we have a good friend providing some real drums as well. But I think overall the mix is quite okay but it's it's a bit lacking in this area and it's a bit heavy in the low end. So that's why I ended up with these settings. So let's look at the imager. So the width control will adjust the amount of gain in the side channel. That's usually what, what a width control is doing. So if I increase this, then the side signal will be louder. And if I decrease it, then the side signal will be quieter. And at the minimum position here, then the side signal is completely quiet and the signal has turned into mono. We can see that on the correlation meter here that it's uh, straight at the top. And I know that this kind of control is very tempting to use because it sounds wider when you increase it and it sounds more impressive and it gets more uh, embracing and everything. What also happens is that the relative level of the center signal is lowered. So the important elements in the center of the mix, like the, the vocals and the kick and the snare drum, will be lowered in level compared to the rest of the mix. So I would use this with caution and be very careful to listen to how the balances within the mix are affected. But sometimes a little nudge in the right direction will make the mix open up a bit. Now the stereoize feature here, uh, I had to read in the manual what this does. It seems to be an Haas effect based decorrelation processing. This mode creates a delayed copy of the mid channel signal and injects it into the side channel. So this is basically creating an artificial stereo image by using the center information and spreading it out in the, the uh, side signal. So mode 1 and mode 2 seem to be variations on this um, method. And I can't really remember the last time I actually used some sort of stereoization processing when I was mastering. So I don't think I would use this, but let's have a listen to it. Well, it sure gets wider, that's for sure. I will disable the other processing and let's have a listen to the delta signal. Okay, so it seems to be only in the difference signal. If you're listening to this in mono, then you probably don't hear anything now. Uh, yeah, the sum is quiet. Everything is in the difference channel. So it is mono compatible because it doesn't add anything to the mid channel, to the sum signal. But I'm not sure that I would actually use this on a mix that is already stereo. Maybe if I had a mono mix, let's add, uh, um, let's make this mix mono. Okay, so now we're faking a stereo signal. Let's exaggerate this, see what it does. Okay. Okay, so I guess that this would be kind of sort of useful uh, for certain use cases when there is a mono mix and you want to have it appear a bit more in stereo. Then this could probably be a good alternative instead of using room ambience or a reverb or something like that. And I would also guess that this is a very good tool for um, music production if you have a mono instrument and you want to make it sound wider. But for mastering a stereo mix, I would probably not use the stereoize function at all, only use this slider if it was needed. 
So let's have a look at the maximizer. The purpose of a maximizer is to increase the loudness of the master. And in order to do that, it needs to control the peaks of the signal. Many of you already know these things, but if you are new to mastering, then it's good to have a solid understanding of peak levels and loudness. So if we look at this mix, for example, then we can see that there is some headroom above the loudest peaks. So we can increase the loudness of the mix until uh, any of the peaks reach, reaches 0 dBFS, which is the limit for how loud the signal can be. But if we want to make the mix even louder, then we need some way to take care of these peaks, because otherwise they will just uh, clip. So the purpose of the maximizer is both to increase the level of the mix and also to take care of the peaks that would somehow need to be reduced so that we can increase the level of the mix. So in the maximizer we have some controls. We can set the mode and these are different strategies that are being used to reduce the peaks. And then we can set the threshold. And like in many other peak limiters, this parameter does two things. It will both set the level where the limiting will begin. So every peak that is louder than this threshold will be reduced. And it will also add gain so that this level ends up at 0 dBFS instead. So you can either see it as a threshold that is lowered into the signal while also adding gain afterwards. Or you could see it as if the threshold is actually at 0 dBFS and you are boosting into this threshold. Because that's really what's happening. So when I'm reducing the threshold, then the maximizer is both adding gain and it's also taking care of the peaks that would otherwise cause clipping at the output. The ceiling parameter is simply an output level after the limiting. So in this step, we are pushing the signal towards 0 dBFS. And in the ceiling control, we are lowering the output level so that the peaks end up at a lower level than 0 dBFS. And 1 dB of ceiling is usually a good advice if you want to publish your songs to streaming platforms like Spotify or YouTube or Tidal or wherever. Now the next parameter is called character. And here we can use the handy tooltip that uh, Ozone is providing us. Controls the attack and release times of the maximizer. So anytime that we use peak limiting, then we will get artifacts of some kind. Because adding loudness and reducing peaks is not a free lunch, you will need to sacrifice some sound quality as well. That is the whole problem with the loudness war and all of that. And this parameter will let you decide what kind of artifacts that you prefer. So if I exaggerate the peak limiting and we have a listen, then we can already now hear some pumping. And if I reduce this, then we get distortion. And if I set it to slow, then we get pumping and uh, softening of transients. So with this control, you can pick your poison, so to speak. And getting a loud master is very much about balancing these artifacts. There are mainly four artifacts that you are balancing. It's distortion, it's softening of transients, it's pumping, and it's changes in the tonal balance. These are the four main artifacts from peak limiting. And we talk about this in depth in our course, Audio Mastering Fundamentals, where we dive deep into how you can listen for these types of artifacts and how you can set the limiter in order to avoid them or at least hide them. And if you're interested in that, you can find the link in the description. So this character parameter, at the fast end, then the peak limiting will approach clipping. So the sound will be closer to clipping. So that's a very aggressive type of peak limiting. At the slower end, then it will react much slower. So there will be less distortion, but it will also not sound as loud and you will also get more pumping effects and more softening of the transients. I haven't used this maximizer so much, so I, I don't know really where the limits are for this one. But the problems and the compromises are the same in pretty much any limiter and the, the ways that you fix it is pretty much similar in any limiter. You will need to learn how the artifacts sound and how you can tweak the parameters to minimize them. And another way to do that is to use this control 
or these controls, I should say, they are two, but they are linked. This is the stereo independence. And this is simply how much should the left and right channel be able to be limited individually. If we, for example, have this control at uh, zero and there is a loud peak in the left channel, then the right channel will also be reduced even though there isn't a peak in the right channel at the moment. But if we set this at 100%, then the channels are acting independently. So if there is a loud peak in the left channel, then the left channel will be reduced, but the right channel will stay as it is. And generally, if you want to have a loud master, then you would want to have the channels acting independently. But if the stereo image starts to tilt, then you might want to reduce this so that left and right act more together instead of individually. And if that control isn't enough, you can also unlink the transient and the sustained parts of the signal. So if there is a fast transient, then you can have full independence between left and right. But if there is sustained peak reduction, then you can have the limiter to act more in a linked manner. I would probably leave this at 100% as a starting point. But as I said, I'm not that familiar with how the limiter sounds, so, so I would probably need to tweak that. Now, one thing I found in the manual is that it says that when both sliders are set to 100%, it's, uh, it's possible to achieve a louder output from the maximizer, but this can result in a narrow stereo image. And as I said, I'm not that familiar with this maximizer, but in my experience from other limiters, it's usually the opposite. If the limiter is stereo linked, then it will tend to narrow the perceived stereo width of the monster. But maybe it's different in this limiter. Okay, so the last parameter is the transient emphasis. It will allow us to fine-tune the shaping of transients before the limiting takes place. This can be useful for preserving sharper sound like drums while still optimizing loudness. So this is a way to address the softening of transients artifact that is very common in limiters. So in theory, this would let us have a more gentle type of peak limiting to avoid the distortion that we will have from a more aggressive type of peak limiting, while also retaining some of the transients. Okay, so now the question is, how loud should the master be? And as I see it, there are two strategies we can use. We can either make the master sound as loud as possible without sounding bad. That's usually the approach that I'm using. We can also aim for a specific loudness target. If you are, for example, targeting a specific playlist in Spotify and you see that all the other music in that playlist is around, say, minus eight luffs, then you will probably want to end up at that loudness as well. And in Ozone, I think it should be possible to do both of these methods. Let's have a look at the first one. First, I think I should reset all the settings. And I think this button resets the current module to the factory default settings. That's great. Ah, there we have the 2db gain as well. That's very sneaky. We'll remove that. One method of finding the optimal loudness for a mix is to reduce the peaks until you start hearing the limiter and then back off a little bit. And the simplest way to do this is to use this link button down here. If you press this, then the threshold and the ceiling will be linked. And what this means is that we will have unity gain through the limiter. So there will be no change in loudness when I uh, reduce this. And then we can reduce this until we begin hearing the effects of the peak limiting. So let's do that. So I will start by reducing the peaks a bit too much, just to hear what that sounds like. And since we're now having unity gain through this maximizer, I can disable and enable it without any jumps in loudness. So at this point, I think the peak limiting is quite audible. So the next thing to do is to adjust the other settings to see if I can make the peak limiting sound less obvious, less audible. And from what I've read in the manual, the uh, IRC2 mode seemed to be um, more suitable for this kind of music. It seemed to be optimized to preserve transients more, even when aggressive limiting is taking place. So that seems like our use case. So we'll switch to that mode.
transients sound more clear and upfront to me. So that's good. Now we can hear the distortion quite clearly when having the lowest character setting. Okay, so I'm exaggerating the transient emphasis here. Maybe a bit of it will sound good. Okay, a couple of observations here. I think minus 10 dB is a pretty good uh, place to be. It sounds fairly transparent, I think. Uh, for the character setting, I think it starts to distort quite quickly when you reach the, the lower values. So somewhere around the default settings seem to be a pretty good compromise for that. I like the sound of having these at uh, 100%. Sounds a bit wider, a bit more transparent to my ears. For this material, I don't think the transient emphasis is doing anything good. It sounds distorted and it sounds a bit too crunchy for my ears. So I will leave that off. And I think the IRC2 mode sounds the best in this case. So I would say that something like this sounds pretty good on this material. So I will unlink this and I will restore the ceiling to minus 1 dB. So now we have restored the, the final loudness. Okay, so I think now is a good time to look at the meters and I have honestly not paid any attention to those so far. Uh, I would set it to integrated LUFs. That's probably the most useful so that you can see um, the approximate loudness of the master that you're working with. And in this case, I think we ended up quite loud. A bit too loud, I think. Uh, I can hear the limiter artifacts. Minus 8.5 integrated. That's a pretty loud master. Not the loudest master in the world, but a bit too loud for, for this kind of peak limiting, I think. But yeah, now we can see the integrated LUFS value here, and we also have a readout of the peak levels here. Okay, the other approach to setting the final loudness is to aim for a specific target. And to do this, you can either have reference tracks that you compare to by ear to hear if they sound equally loud, or you can measure the loudness using a LUFS meter. Let's say that we are targeting a playlist where all the other music is at minus seven LUFS, for example. Then we would need to go much louder. So what I would do then is to try and find, um, Try to find the settings that will push the integrated loudness into the area where we want to be. And we can do this by hand, by listening and looking at the meters. Or we can use a feature that is called learn threshold. So if I was to enter minus seven here and then press learn threshold, then it will try to find the best setting for that. Okay, so now it's pushing it quite a lot. Let's see. Yeah, we're ending up at minus six now, but it should have been aiming for minus seven. Okay, maybe that's a bit too much. Let's try something else. Minus 10. Okay, so now it seems to have ended up somewhere around what we actually aimed for. I don't know how useful this feature is, but yeah, it's there. In this section, we have bypass, gain match, mono, and swap. 
So what does these do? Well, bypass is just bypass. It bypasses all the processing. And since we're adding a lot of gain in the processing, then the bypass button doesn't really work for comparing because of the loudness bias. But luckily, there is also a gain match feature built in. So when this is enabled, then the plugin will loudness match before and after. So if we listen with gain match enabled, then we will hear that it's much easier to hear the difference between before and after. And it does this matching by adding gain to the bypassed version. So we see that we get a lot of clipping uh, when doing this. And I have some additional headroom in my monitoring chain. So this will not clip for me when I'm listening. But if you are hearing distortion when you see these clipping, then you probably will need to reduce the output level from, um, from the channel so that you avoid clipping your monitoring output. Just remember to restore that before rendering the final master. Okay, so then we have a mono button. This will let us listen in mono. Very useful for checking mono compatibility. And we also have a swap button that will swap left and right. And this is very useful for checking the stereo balance so that the master is not tilting to the left or to the right. Okay, so that I think is enough about all the features in this plugin. It went on a bit longer than I had planned, but you know. But there is one feature in Ozone Elements that we haven't talked about yet, and that is the Master Assistant. So let's have a look at that. Now, this is the kind of thing that will eventually ruin any kind of business opportunity for us mastering engineers. So it's kind of interesting to see what we are up against. So what are you going for? Intensity, low, medium or high? It's set to medium, and let's do that. Destination, streaming or CD? Let's go with streaming. Okay, for the best results, play the loudest portion of your track. I think this track is pretty consistent, so I will just go from where I am, I think. Yes, um, okay, maybe I'm supposed to press play. Okay, assistance is working, great. Analyzing audio. Setting equalizer. Setting maximizer. Okay, that's it. It's mastered. Accept. Okay. Ah, that's great. So now the threshold is set, the ceiling is set, the character is set, transient, stereo independence, everything is set up. The imager is disabled. Okay. Okay, so I actually agree with the AI overlords in this case. We have some additional high end and it has also reduced a bit in the mids, very wide. Okay, and then there is some additional low end. Yeah, okay, that's fine. So let's have a listen. I think that's quite okay. I think this boost should be lower down. I don't think there's that much music up here in this area. I would rather have this a bit lower down, but but otherwise I think it's quite okay. It seems to have uh, aimed for something like minus 12 luffs, and that's where we have ended up at least. So okay, let's try the other settings. I want high intensity streaming, okay. Waiting for you to play. Ah, this didn't appear the last time. So now it's a bit louder. Now we have some more processing here. Uh, and still no imaging. Okay, now we have a different EQ setting. This is a much wider filter. Still placed at 10 kilohertz, but okay. Let's see what happens if we are choosing CD as destination instead. Okay, so now we have pretty much the same loudness, but it moved the ceiling to minus 0.3. Yeah, that kind of makes sense. If you're only aiming for CD, then we don't need all the headroom that we need for streaming. So that's fine. Uh, otherwise, it seems to be the same processing. 
And this is the same as well. What's this? It's doing something. Let's see. Okay, so it's also adding 0.2 dB. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fine, I guess. Okay, one last time. Now we're going for streaming and low intensity. Okay, so now there is not as much loudness. There is still these settings uh, and the equalizer. Yeah, it's the same equalizer. Okay, so the master assistant is, yeah, it's doing a pretty good job, I would say. I think it's too bright. I don't think we need all that energy up in this region. But overall, it's doing somewhat the right thing. And the thing I like about it is that it's doing these broad strokes. It's not doing any narrow dips or peaks. So that I kind of like, and I think that this approach, when the program is measuring the actual audio, that's a much better way of doing this than to use these presets. I have never understood these presets, because contemporary jazz, for example, what does that look like? I just can't understand how this would be a universally uh, useful setting for an EQ for jazz it's it's just so dependent on how the mix sounds so this is just i don't get it vintage rock for example why would this sound like vintage rock i have no idea but when the plugin is actually measuring the mix then it's kind of a different thing and i would guess that the full version of ozone have a lot more features when it comes to the master assistant so to wrap this up is this a good plugin yes i think it is a good plugin the equalizer is very competent, it sounds and behaves just as I would expect it to. There are some workflow issues, but I think that's much due to my own preferences and that I'm not used to using this uh, equalizer. And the maximizer sounds kind of okay, I think it's a bit on the aggressive side, it's not very transparent from what I've heard so far, but maybe I need to get to know the settings a bit more in order to tweak it optimally. And as I said in the beginning, if you are mastering your own music, then I think this kind of solution is quite good. Because since you have access to the full mix, then all you really need is an equalizer and a maximizer in order to produce the final master. As a mastering engineer, I could not rely on this only. I would need other plugins as well. But I will probably use the maximizer at times when I'm looking for this kind of character in the limiting. So I hope you found this video helpful. Please hit the like button if you did and also subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell if you want to see more videos from us. So thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time.